So as we know, uh, we're all about connection today and the importance of that, of being seen and heard and valued. Uh, as Ainsley said this morning, it's what counts in life and it couldn't be more important as we're confronted by complex crises, floods, cyclone and with more to come. We're all learning new terms, the latest of which seems to be atmospheric rivers, which we're uh, being hit by now. The Eastern Bay of Plenty is currently under pressure. Under pressure. And to make matters worse, we are taking, as we've heard, insufficient action to bend the curves. We need to brace for more dire outcomes, unless, hopefully, we start to take action and be, as we heard today, good ancestors. Now, I'd sort of started thinking of the phrase good ancestor as a, <clears throat> a bit of a glib phrase um, until uh, a recent event. My brother, this was just about a week ago, was scrolling through Facebook, as you do. There were some black and white photos from the 30s that had been posted by somebody in the Chatham Islands. And he stopped at one photo and thought, oh, that looks familiar. He sent it around to us all. We saw this photo of a young Maori woman uh, sitting, on, uh, sitting outside a house holding a dog and um, realised it was our nana. And it was only the second photo I've ever seen of her as a young woman. And my nana, uh, she actually grew up in Temuka, then she moved to the Chathams to help out an elderly aunt, had a very hard life. And when she got married to my grandfather, to my papa, Ned, they moved into their own home, but it had dirt floors. Uh, they had six children. The first one, unfortunately, um, passed away of pneumonia. And that was a, a devastation they never really recovered from to the point that when my older sister got pneumonia as a three-year-old, my, my papa sat by her bedside day and night in the hospital until she was better. He was so terrified that she might meet the same fate. Uh, but they, they uh, managed to bring four of their six children into adulthood. The other one, unfortunately, passed away in her late teens um, of meningitis. Uh, all the four that survived were very successful. And when I think now, as I was looking at this photo and just feeling such wonderful connection with my nana, and I was sitting in my villa with its polished wood floors, and I thought the decisions she made to leave the Chathams, to bring her family to Christchurch, away from her dirt floors, and to set up a hub in Christchurch that became a, a, a place of importance for Māori and non-Māori, means that I get this house right now with these polished wood floors and my healthy children. And, um, and I felt such love and gratitude for her. And I realised that's because she was a good ancestor. And so the decisions that we make right now, the decisions we make in this room, as we're sitting here, in fact, taking any action that we do during the day, those actions affect uh, future generations. They affect our children, they affect the quality of their lives and their children's lives and so on. And so we can actually think about what we're doing in this very moment as having power and influence and impact and being a good ancestor. And so that brings me to our first session for this afternoon. Uh, and that is a pre-recorded talk from Professor Sir Peter Gluckman. He's going to talk about living with complexity and change. Couldn't be more important right now. So please, a round of applause for the President of the International Science Council, Sir Peter Gluckman. Sure. I'm sorry I cannot be with you, but I'm overseas uh, in my role as President of the International Science Council. As you know, I chair... Koi Tu, the Centre for Informed Futures. And most of our focus is on the issue of how societies live, adapt, and cope with complexity and change. And that's not simple. We tend always to want to try and simplify and look for simple solutions and simple uh, outcomes from what are really very complex situations. And that's exacerbated by the fact that the short-term political cycle focuses on the short term. The media, and particularly social media, don't like dealing with complexity particularly well. And so we're always looking for singular solutions when complexity, by definition, means that solutions are also complex. And there's another dimension to this which is time. We're very good at thinking about the short term. We're not so good about thinking about the long term. And that happens at every scale from families choosing whether or not to invest in savings to the world and choosing how and when finally to start addressing the issues of climate change. And we do all of this 
against the background of our own biases, our own values, our own identities. In the face of a world in which technology allows these to be more manipulated by misinformation, disinformation, information overload, which leads to a significant number of problems and challenges, and how we, whether as individuals or organisations or a government, actually makes a decision. Our short-term political cycle is a particular challenge. We have a shallow democracy in the sense that we do not have an upper house, we have a relatively small parliament, we don't have a, a cluster of think tanks and other activities, other organisations that lead to a much more robust long-term thinking. We're starting to see that with the emergence of the Sustainability Commission, the Climate Change Commission, the Parliamentary Commission for the Environment. But when we think more broadly into the various social and other issues that are out there, we tend to fall back into the short term very easy. One of the issues which I spent a lot of time commenting on, both globally and nationally, is the risk issue of planning for and responding to risk. This is the midterm of a review this year of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, which pointed out in that midterm review that, in fact, while risk assessment may be well developed by professionals at risk assessment, the way in which governments respond to those risk assessments is not. It's a gap which I've called risk, the gap in risk listening. I saw that when I was chief science advisor, we see it around the world, where non-experts want to underplay or counteract the assessment of risk made by domain experts. They may be uncomfortable to be told that there are risks they need to plan for, which are large, and by not acknowledging them or reducing their impact, they avoid difficult policy and financial decisions. We need to be much more transparent in our risk assessment processes, and our politicians need to think about how risk assessment has turned to policy responses in ways that ensure that the expert assessments are not ignored and that the various cognitive biases each of us may have and the political biases they will have to focus on the short term are got beyond. This is not easy. There are many reasons why we tend and the political process tends to focus on the short term. But as we've seen with climate change, with our own infrastructure issues, on issues of our health and education system, and in planning for the economic challenges ahead, as we remain a relatively uh, low growth economy, uh, these are issues that need years to resolve and need long-term thinking and risk assessments which are transparent and not hidden within political uh, uh, back doors. Publics need to be involved. Publics need to be engaged. Experts need to be engaged beyond ministries if we're to get to a more trustworthy situation. Bad things will always happen. Earthquakes happen. Storms happen. Pandemics happen. Climate change is happening, unfortunately. Space weather events will occur. Are we well prepared for that full range of events? Even if we cannot identify and some things will overwhelm us, like a major earthquake, there's a lot of preparation we can do, a lot of protections we can put in place. But this must transcend the political cycle and the political process as much as it can. It can never transcend it completely because, of course, it involves money. One of the issues I particularly worry about is the state of our society. We are a multicultural society based on bicultural underpinnings with a particular history 
and consequences of that history, how will we maintain social cohesion in a world which is rapidly changing because change in itself is threatening? Social cohesion can be defined by two dimensions, trust between those who govern and those who are governed, and the institutions that surround that, such as law, police, parliament, and so forth. And that's a reciprocal relationship. And that relationship is harmed if there's not better, greater transparency and honesty in the process. And we have concerns. Ombudsmen's or the generals have raised issues with successive governments over the level of transparency or not. Secondly, Social cohesion relies on trust between peoples in our society who, by definition, will have different identities, different worldviews, different value sets. And that needs to have ways of talking more constructively with each other and finding ways ahead and how to agree and how to recognise that majority decision-making must always protect the interests of minorities in that decision-making process. Again, misinformation, disinformation, the role of social media, uh, the shift of mainstream media to be infotainment rather than, than information sharing, all compromise these two dimensions of social trust. And yet we need social trust in a small, vulnerable country if we're going to make the big decisions that need to be made to protect the country's interests environmentally, socially, and economically. In that regard, there are many new methodologies in democracy and empowering people to be involved, involved in decision-making. Tokenistic consultation is not good democracy. In COI 2, we focus on using techniques like Citizens Forum, very sophisticated forms of electronic consultation, true consultation, dialogue, reciprocation, engagement, to actually help people through these tough decisions and making sure they understand the complexity, the inevitable trade-offs, the fact that there's never a free lunch, in making decisions. And I would think that particularly in the areas that the Commission is particularly interested in, in sustainability, true consultative techniques are needed and will, be, will help the Commission and governments make far more acceptable decisions involving large investments over many years rather than using superficial techniques or decisions made from on high. So I think although it may sound a long way from the sustainability agenda, it's not. If we don't have the public brought in to the agenda and understand why major investment shifts are needed and why long-term thinking is needed and how complexity must be handled and acknowledged, then all of us will struggle to see New Zealand meet the challenges that are there in a time of rapid change. Complexity and change are the two things that societies must now be prepared for. Thank you very much.